everyone and welcome to this um, CGAG webinar, which is the sixth and final in this series on artificial intelligence in higher education. So this was an exciting and timely series um, that covered six webinars with excellent speakers on various aspects of AI in the sector. My name is Janja Komljenovic and I'm from Lancaster University. I organized this series for CG. Today we will be hearing from Christine Odea on ChatGPT in higher education, very timely topic. Welcome, Christine. Um, Christine is a senior fellow of Higher Education Academy. She's currently a subject group lead and deputy head of department at business school at University of Huddersfield. But before I hand over to Christine, there are some brief housekeeping points to mention. So this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the CGHG website um, in a couple of weeks. A transcript of the chat function conversation will also be posted um, and we'll also try and post this in our podcast series. Please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or uh, ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, during the talk, but please do so uh, if and when you ask a question. We recommend using the speaker view so you can more clearly see who is talking. And if you want to ask a question, please use the chat function and write out your question. Um, feel free to start doing this immediately, so even during the talk, and I will keep an eye on that. And at the end of the presentation, um, I will then select the questions um, and you'll be invited to ask it yourself directly. In such a case, when invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where you're from. Okay, uh, now uh, without further ado, Christine, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Jadja. Um, Thank you uh, for inviting me, Jaji and colleagues, and it's really nice to meet everybody here. I'm going to start sharing screen, and if you can't see it, please do let me or Jaji know. Right, so that's my screen, so I already put it as a presentation mode, so I'm hoping everybody is able to see it. Right, so... Uh, Jaja already introduced me, so I, I won't talk any more about myself. So today it is the topic is on chat GPT and generative AI. But if you see the introduction, it actually has a particular focus on um, okay, on prompt engineering. So that's going to be my main topic for today's webinar. So there are four areas, as you can see from the screen that I'm going to cover in my today's talk. So I'm going to have a brief introduction about AI literacy and what is prompt engineering. And then we will have a look at some practical techniques on how to produce uh, effective AI prompts. Then we'll look at some designing ideas for staff and for students. So from both perspectives. And then finally, we look at some main issues and concerns relating to mainly to the use of a generative AI and including the prompt engineering and then follow will be followed by a, a QA part of the webinar. So before going to the details, I've just uh, here just a, a list of uh, some brief AI tools. Uh, I came across, um, I, I didn't use all of them, I have to say, uh, there's too many of them. So I sort of labeled them and grouped them so you can see what kind of functions that they uh, play. So at the top, we have what I call all-rounders, just uh, so you can use it for pretty much anything uh, for most circumstances. And we all know ChatGPT, so I don't need to go for further for, for that one. Uh, the new one is called Cloudy. I'm not sure it has any of you Childage. It is also free and you register using it pretty much the same way that you register use chat GPT 3.5. Um, I haven't tested myself. Um, I've sort of I just didn't want to give a more of my mobile number to another system, but I've read about the comparison. So Cloudy apparently the, the strength is compared to 
chat GPT 3.5 is allowing you to upload the P uh, PDF and Word documents, and it's better at summarizing um, some key points. Anybody's interested in doing research or trying to um, help students use any of the generative AI tools to summarize and synthesize some literature review, it could be a potential idea, uh, ideal tool. And then we've got um, some kind of images, writing, videos, and music, and PPTs. Um, most of you probably familiar with Do, uh, Dao E, but Dao E is free. Dao E2 is not free. Is any of you interested in doing images? Those are the main differences. And you also have a deep AI and um, probably stable diffusion. I mostly use BART and ChatGPT. Um, I'm not so keen personally with Bing because I don't find it very flexible. So I just thought I'd give you some ideas. So if you are kind of keen to produce music and PowerPoint, et cetera, videos, there, there are plenty options and some of them are free some of them you've got to pay so it's it's up to kind of your preference and what you you prefer to do so the first part is a, a brief introduction to ai literacy and prompt engineering so literacy we, we we all have a rough idea what literacy is it's basically just looking at your ability to read and to write for AI literacy, again, within this context of artificial intelligence, we're, we're mainly looking at, or particularly in the current um, generative AI era, is, is about how can you actually develop your skills and competencies or capability in using those AI tools and applications to achieve a particular purposes or to help you complete any specific tasks. But the focus here is on the ethically and responsively. A anybody here can use a chat GPT. You, you, you hardly need any training, but to use it ethically and responsibly is really quite challenging. I'll talk about that in more detail in my latest slides. But for AI literacy, that's where the probably the focal point ethics and how you can use it responsibly. So this one, just to give you some quick brief overview about some key facts. Again, for AI literacy, there's no clear kind of a definition or looking at exactly which discipline or boundary it belongs to. But for me, based on my own understanding and my research, I think it's perfectly okay to think AI literacy to consider it as a specific type of a digital literacy. So digital literacy obviously is a big a slightly more umbrella term compared to AI literacy. So AI literacy just specifically relating to AI or generative AI tools. If we look at the categories of the skills, there are just generally speaking, we have a technical skills uh, like fundamental computing, computer science, you got coding, machine learning, that kind of a basic AI fundamental knowledge. You would also have a non-technical skills these are the common ones that you can see from the scoring here. We have ethics, we got transparency, fairness, how to evaluate the outputs, and you got GDPR and you got copyright, all these related issues and how do you follow the guidance and policy. For the, for the research relating to AI literacy, it actually can be back, trace, traced back to about 2016, some of the early publications. However, the main interest really came in from the end of 2022 when, when we see the, the popularity of the generative AI, including myself, um, focusing on AI literacy now as well as one of my main research areas. There are lots of lots of new papers and research that's been carried out in this particular area. But for the um, for all of us, for you know, for students and staff point of view, it is critical to understand the, not only the benefits, also the limitations of those tools and how can we use it more effectively. For students in particular, even though it is critical for them to have a fundamental understanding, but they do not necessarily need to develop the skill of understanding the different algorithms or complicated computing, uh, computer coding uh, knowledge. It just depends on what's your role and what you use it for. But it is it is important to have that fundamental knowledge. At least we, we need to know or they need to know 
the, how AI generated AI tools use the training data and how are answers being generated and interpreted by AI tools. For today's pre uh, webinar, sorry, I was gonna to say presentation, but for today's webinar, I didn't actually include the fundamental of what um, art artificial intelligence is. So I'd assume people mostly understand that fundamental knowledge and also probably the previous webinars um, presenters have already mentioned. So I haven't covered that bit. So the next thing is, okay, um, is prompt engineering. Again, it's personally, I consider as a essential AI literacy skill. So the definition, as you can see, is quite straightforward. It's nothing difficult there to understand. Again, for the key words I highlighted here is the precise and informative questions, which allows users to acquire these kind of desired outputs Many of you might be thinking, actually, they shouldn't be difficult. I know what to ask ChatGPT. Anybody can use ChatGPT. You receive no training. That's absolutely fine. You know, as long as you, you can connect to internet, you, you have a white browser or even not on your phone, you can ask questions. But surprisingly, I'll give you an example in a minute of my own example as well. It's quite difficult to get the correct uh, questions in and to get ChatGPT or other similar tools to produce the answers you're looking for. Um, a recent research I did with a, a group of colleagues, and we're looking how uh, ChatGPT might be used to support student uh, critical thinking skills. And the, the questionnaires came out, many students commented, I just couldn't get ChatGPT to generate the answers I want. I just can't get it work. They felt frustrated, and it was a good number of uh, comments like that. So it shows students actually not really sure exactly what to do in, in this area. So some of you might have seen the news. This is probably in um, the techie world. This is one of the biggest news. Um, I got this news off from times.com, uh, but you, you if you search on Google, you find those of a uh, similar kind of um, a repose. So this is a new Google backed up, the AI, backed AI startup, startup called Anthropic, I, I don't know if I pronounce it right, but this is a new company um, advertised uh, a prompt engineer role. Uh, sometimes I think in early this year for 335K dollars for a prompt engineer role. And so I convert it into, um, into pounds. So give you a brief idea. Um, this news really has stirred water. Um, I'll show you some additional market trends in the, in the next slide, but you can see you now the prompt engineering, it wasn't a big thing even in 2022, but sadly in 2023, it caught up so much of attention. However, different news or different people's opinion, I've listed one um, which I've showed you, share the, the information on the, um, on the, uh, the uh, reference slide as well. This job may not be for everybody and may not last forever. It could be something booming only for 2023 and disappeared in 2024. We don't know. However, it shows the critical kind of a position where prompt engineering taking place, at least for now, for this next couple of years. So other trends, as you can see, chat GPT and related uh, generative AI to now become the skills in using those and become the, one of the hottest new skill. On LinkedIn, you can see compared to 2022, jobs mentioning generative AI has increased 36 times just within a year. We haven't even finished 2023. And it covers wide range of uh, organizations or different companies, digital advising, software development, and healthcare and utility. So it shows prompt engineers. Now it is a sort of an important job or role or skill, however you consider. It's about that fine tuning, what you can get chat GPT or similar tools to produce the answers that you're looking for. Only you manage that tool like this would help you save money. It's not any answers will help you or, or improve productivity. It has to be the desired answer that you're looking for that would help you. So as you can see, again, in the middle, I highlighted it's about help AI understand context, the nuances and the intention be behind every query or question you input. 
and also again coming with the, the high demand as you can see there are plenty plenty online training courses on prompt engineering some of them again free some of them you got to pay but one of the hot, hottest skills on the market. So I'm showing you one unsuccessful prompt I've just done recently. So I like to, to design lots of uh, e-learning uh, material software my, myself. In the past, I, I used to be working with graphic designers. So now with, the, with those kind of AI tools, so I thought to myself, oh, how about I just try out myself? Then that way I save time, save hassle and everything. So you can see the two that I use, DeepAI and Stable Diffusion, they both are free. And my question here, initially without the orange bait, can you create a tree vector? That's what I'm thinking of using. Um, I would like to be able to, to add it individually using any software later on. So firstly, this is what I got with DeepAI. You can see, um, okay, it's not what I'm looking for. And then with Stable Diffusion, okay, that's, that's the thing I got and miles away from what I wanted. Then I kind of uh, trying to um, increase or prompt uh, my uh, my um, question with that beige orange words with big leaves. So what I got here, second time uh, like that, that's still not what I'm looking for. Getting slightly more closer to what I wanted, but still not. But with stable diffusion, uh, no, not at all. But again, I'm not an expert in uh, graphic design or image data, and I certainly haven't played around with DPI or stable diffusion that much. But using this example, I just wanted to show you, even though with people like myself actually um, use generative AI all the time and working quite hard with prompt engineers, you can see there's still a problem. And this frustrates me because it doesn't get what I want it to be, where I want to get. So when you when you actually practice yourself, remember, doesn't matter how advanced these tools become, they are still just machine. They can't read your mind. You really got to try it yourselves. And also look, learn from other people, what other people do in different areas, whether you want to make videos, images, PowerPoint presentation, et cetera. So I just thought I'd share my personal experience here. Not very successful so far. So writing effect prompts, if we look at some basic techniques, again, those techniques is not really say subject specific, they're just more of a generic guidance. So firstly, we're talking about interactive prompting. So when, when you write or enter you, uh, entering your questions into chat GPT or BAT, trying to speak to AI like as if you're talking to a colleague, a friend, a family members, you provide Context and you, 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 if you need to, you can give them a name and you talk about possibilities, like you even like you write email, you do formal conversation, informal conversations. You normally provide contact, you don't just throw in the question without giving any details. And it works exactly the same way when you're speaking to Chat GPT or say BAT. Think about what kind of background information, what kind of a context you can um, you can supply to to make sure the GPT can answer the give you the answers you're looking for, and role play is another really quite critical element. We we actually you see so many people um to to actually ask GPT to provide answers uh, doing a particular role, experienced tutor as inexperienced as uh, somebody trying to learn uh, or trying to act as a recruiter. It's just depending on what you're trying to get it to answer. And also remember bringing ChatGPT back uh, on track if it kind of losing the, uh, the point. So you, you see here, I'll, I'll show this example again in the next couple of slides. So you can simply ask, how can I develop a new syllabus for undergraduate module without giving any content? But then if you want better answer, you can say, which year, what module, what subject area, are you a new lecturer or not? Um, do you have a teaching experience and how many examples, word limits, et cetera. So you can put lots of contacts there to um, direct or guide ChatGPT. And also for the, when you're trying to get it back on track, think about questions like, what do you think about? What evidence support your, suppose you answer? It's a little bit like you're you're actually doing a semi-structured interviews. You know, we always say you need to prompt your interviewees to give you more answers. So based on what sort of answer you get, you're gonna to keep prompting, asking follow-up questions. 
So the techniques here continually break things down. So thinking about like conversation, you say one thing and then you follow up. However, be, be careful. My personal experience, it doesn't work with bad. Bad doesn't really have this like a memory loss is suffering. It doesn't remember what you said. So you often, when you're using bad, you, you, you need to continue giving that extra information. But this breaking things down works best with chat GPT. Again, everything I'm talking about here is chat GPT 3.5. I, I don't really encourage people to, to pay unless you're, you're really keen to, uh, to pay. Most of us just using chat GPT 3.5 and I think it works just fine. Um, if you want to try GP, uh, GPT-4 and above, try BAD, I think it works quite well as well. Again, I'm trying lots of different multiple alternatives, trying different options, think about different ways, asking questions, and trying to um, readjust the length of the questions. You see the example I gave examples I gave you in the next couple of slides. Some of the questions are hugely long. So just trying to give uh, ChatGPT a bit better contact and background information. And also, as I mentioned, giving out those follow-up questions. If ChatGPT gave you answer and keep asking, what do you mean? Can you, can you go further? And what do you mean by these words? And can you give additional examples? So these ones are more of a generic techniques. So now we're moving on to about more of a curriculum designing ideas, again, from tutor and student perspectives. For tutors, again, you can use it for um, normal teaching sessions. You can co-curriculum activities, assessments, um, providing feedbacks. You can do use it as an um, extracurriculum or just a, more of a suggestions, finding out a bit more uh, specific type of uh, learning or teaching approaches. So lesson planning, sorry, before going that, this is the bit that, yeah, I want to reinforce. Don't do just what it says. Try to think about, does it actually work for you? Use it as a foundational basis to produce the answers. And also, I, I just want to acknowledge the information I got mainly here, those next two slides from University of Sydney that I actually altered some of the, the prompts based on my own experience. But I've, I've provided the reference uh, to the uh, two um, blog posts generated by uh, Danny Liu, and I, I highly recommend. I think Australian colleagues are strong, very strong in uh, generative AI in support learning and teaching area. So lessening, lesson planning. So this is what I put in here, um, undergraduate new syllabus, undergraduate year one module that you just saw. This is my subject area. I teach business analytics. So I, I normally use my own one as well as example. So year one, new lecture, no experience, two detailed syllabus examples. So this is for lesson planning. You, you can tweak and alter with your, your own things. So you can say uh, detailed syllabus and aiming for a cohort with 20 students. I wanted to, to um, use any specific uh, uh, teaching approach. For example, you might use, um, say, hands-on, uh, experiential or any other approaches that you, you want to, to use and just put in as example. Discussion topics again. So give out five examples, but trying to link those ones to student interests. So you can see the example here. Those are the common uh, areas students tend to be interested in social media influencers, parking on campus and climate change those kind of things. So think about the examples and you could use it for your seminars if you're kind of struggling with creative ideas for, for your sort of a seminar discussions. Because the presentation will be provided with you, shared with you later, you, you can look at these examples later. So I won't spend a huge amount of time on individual examples here. And assessment design, again, so you can see here, I give out quite detailed examples here. I've, I've asked ChatGPT to give me five examples, but I want to cover all learning outcomes and specializing or with special focus on final year media and communication module. And I want to make sure my assessment be able to use a real life scenario or company case study. I'm focusing on evaluating problem solving on critical thinking. And I also specify where the word limit for my ass assessment. Um, I'm saying I need to use an essay format and I listed 
all my learning outcomes. So where you follow up questions will come up like this. Okay, so supposedly the five and you picked up there, there are two or three that they, they look good. And then you, you might want to have a particular focus like this one. How can I uh, support students to effectively learn in the process? You might be thinking of uh, scaffolding the learning processes, things like that, just depending on what you're trying to do and think about your subject speciality. And then to, to work out some rubrics. And this is one thing I think is really useful. It would take you, if you know what to ask, it takes you less than five minutes to, to generate something like this. So you can see here, I've got rubric. Again, I, I tell GPT specifically, this is the second year module. And it's for trainee teachers. I want them to be able to critique the use of a technology in secondary schools. And I specify here the standards as well. And I ask ChatGPT to output this kind of a rub rubric as a table so that I already got ready to use a table. And I want ChatGPT to help me uh, design a strong one through asking me a set of uh, different questions. So that's the rubric. And then finally, it's about in, finally it's about improving feedback for students. And we all know, um, well, student feedback is really critical, isn't it, for an SS, an SS as well. If you have a large cohort of students, it really is difficult. So you might have got some general uh, brief ideas, and you want to chat GPT to help you uh, improve them. That's absolutely fine. It would be a great idea. So here, um, I hope you could see it. I think you you should should be able, but as I said, you see the presentation later um, so you can rewatch it. So you define yourself here, role play, I'm an experienced educator and I will upload my notes to ChatGPT. And I want it to be extended to about a more summative in about 500 words. I, I, I'm exaggerating the situation. We normally don't need 500 words. I would say two to 300 would be enough. And, and aiming at students, gain the mark between 50 to 59. So I want ChatGPT to generate the feedback to point not only the gaps and also for the future improvement, but then I need to upload my assignment brief and also marking rubric as well. So that's academic tutor. So give you my personal scenario here. Okay, so again, this is what I do. I, I am about to teach, this is a real thing. I am about to teach a very large module with over 300 students. And I'm gonna to use a group presentation. And, and to be honest, I really don't want to do this. I have no choice. This has been pre-designed for me. So therefore I'm asking GP, chat GPT, what can I do to encourage participation? We all know the problem relating to group this, uh, presentation. So two things I want to find out, how can I encourage encourage participation and how can I improve the group contribution? So those are the questions I asked. Okay, here's my contact that I'm defining my, well, I'm giving out my background and my contact, large cohort. I have to use a group, group, group presentation and how can I do it in the most time efficient manner? That's really critical for me. So these are things, and also I want the contribution to be recognized by their mark. So these are the follow-up questions that ask, can you provide example of group peer review? So that's one of the suggestions offered by ChatGPT. So I continue with the more following up questions. Okay, predefined roles and responsibility for presentation group members, and then again, show them as a table. And further, further question, how should I calculate the mark for each group presentation, taking the peer review mark into account? And I just give you a couple of screenshots where the answers, you can see here, that's the table, looking at the roles, predefined roles and responsibilities. So I can go ahead and editing it myself. I, I obviously don't need all of the roles. And also here, these are the uh, suggestions where the chat GPT provided based on my first or second question, I think. So this is my personal scenario. So one important question people ask, shall I use generative AI for marking essay? When I say marking essay, it's not just providing feedback, you're actually physically uploading student assessments uh, onto a chat GPT or similar too. But my, my answer really is personal. Again, again, this is a personal view. 
no, don't do this. This is my personal view, simply because GDPA really critical. You upload students' information. It is a student work. They are protected. You can't really, but that's normally going to stop you if you really want to do, but you run a huge risk. And also understanding how the training data works. So please don't don't do this if you can and also they're probably against university policy in in this area as well so this is a common question that's often being asked and if we move on to say what students can do again so similar kind of a structure students can use it to to as a self-test you know quizzes normally we use it prior to chat gpt time is a i normally design a quizzes and upload it to moodle for students to do it but they can do it themselves now so again, you can get them to produce multiple choice questions and allowing students to test, say, fundamental software engineering. Um, you know, you, you want to um, make sure you include the elements to target common misconceptions. Okay, so think about what you can recommend students to do. So for, for their independent learning time. So seratic um, questioning, again, this is a, a approach can be quite popular in terms of uh, promoting deep thinking, deep learning by not answering questions, but answering questions by uh, ans by giving our answers, by asking additional questions, if that makes sense. So here's again, slightly like role play um, kind of a, a thing. I'm a business, uh, well, ChatGPT would be the business information system tutor. So the topics here, I want some kind of integrated ideas, but the question need to be able to help me as a student to apply knowledge to practice. And ask a question when I give out answers so you can then provide that kind of a feedback. The third one is a bit of like a mentor for some kind of thing. So you, you can ask um, uh, chat gpt to to interlink those different areas that you you get students to to explain for this one i i didn't really give you the whole screenshot but i wanting to in a way to help students understand the relationship between those three key areas big data business information systems and data analytics so you can see here one of the follow follow up questions i asked for the second one what do you mean by data analytics as a solvers uh, you, you might not get a whole picture because I obviously didn't post the question, but you can try this one just to find a way of helping students understand the, the relationship or the interconnection between the key concepts with some uh, examples that they, they feel they can relate to. And the next one is the simulator. Again, we can achieve it using simulation software, but I think it's actually quite fun to, to use it, chat GPT. And certainly it's a good way of helping students prepare for interview. As a lot of interviewers like to use a role play, now simulation. So the example here, you can see here that I'm saying that I am a final year student. I'm studying human resource and I want a scenario. I want chat GPT to be that difficult staff. So I'm, I'm now taking up a role as a team leader and I am dealing with a difficult staff who doesn't really do job and always late. So I want ChatGPT to be the difficult staff and I want, want ChatGPT to give me the scenario. And once I give out that kind of information to, to comment on my performance and trying to lean back to any HR theories and policy and depending my answer level. So chat GPT then can readjust the difficult level in terms of these scenarios. And finally, student can use it as a study planner. Again, just the time management. If I got a few days, I want to get this topic covered and what should I do? How many hours I plan to study and what topics uh, I want to uh, cover. So this is mainly for students. So for staff and student, again, you can give students suggestions to lead them to explore themselves, or you, you can even give them time in class or in your seminar, uh, seminars or workshops to get them to, to do this kind of uh, activities. So finally, I just uh, going to briefly talk about issues and concerns. Again, this, this, this webinar isn't on ethics. I could, we could do a, a webinar entirely on ethics because it really is a, a critical, very critical area for 
generative AI and prompt engineering. So some very brief uh, points we need to consider the ethical considerations, ethical issues. AI-generated con content, pri privacy concern, misinformation, manipulation. So ethics is really good. One of the key things about ethically use ChatGPT and looking at responsibly, transparency, fairness. Uh, one of the areas is GDPR, as I mentioned. That's why we, I, I personally don't think it's a good idea for tutors to upload any students produced work um, onto any of those online systems because then what you input there automatically become training data and other people can actually search. They can actually get the answers you input. So it, the consequences can be huge. So GDPR, how GDPR and generative AI plays and what kind of um, rules and policy we should follow. It really, including the intellectual property, all these areas currently are considered as gray areas. There, there are no clear guidance yet. So we, we as a tutor need to be very, very careful about what we do, what we input into these kind of tools. An outcome evaluation, again, we, we all know what chat GPT as well is, you know, is um, it, lots of fake uh, information. I'll explain that in next slide in more details. But outcome evaluation is hugely critical. Whether you're working as a tutor, whether you're a student, whether you're going into industry, to be able to evaluate outcomes generated by generative AI tools, really, really important. And finally, limited model knowledge. Again, depending on which GPT the system is backed up. If it's um if it's GPT, if it's a GPT 3.5, and this final issue is particularly relevant. If it's a BART, Bing, and any other latest one that's powered by GPT 4 and above, uh, I don't really think you need to uh, worry too much about this. But if you are using GPT 3.5, yeah, you, you need to be aware of the limited model knowledge. So finally, it's about this AI outcome um, evaluation. So I, I think most of us are familiar with this one, hallucinations and deep fakes. So hallucinations, most of us are familiar with, the deep fakes are harder to uh, spot because the news just so real, the outputs are so real, it makes the real and fake things together. Uh, they're much more malicious and harder to detect. And I think you read news about the, I think in the US that even with the low years, they they fall into that kind of a trap as, as well. And we, we all read these ones, right? You, you read about the news. I don't have to repeat this one. And on BBC as well, the the, the legal cases relating to, to those uh, fake news generated by uh, chat GPT. So the ability to be able to evaluate those outcomes, really, really critical for both staff and students as well. How do, do we identify those fake news? And that's why I'm saying those issues and limitations identified relating to generative AI really need to pay a great deal attention to. So finally, just uh, some references. Um, just to give you some uh, idea. Um, so as I said, uh, you can see here, the those are the two University of Sydney. Highly recommend you to have a read. Um, so that's where my uh, two sort of slides of examples are based upon. And then we've got uh, some of articles about the um, AI literacy. And also finally, this is my own one, the Times Education, where I, I, I shared my opinion on how to teach AI literacy. So these are my uh, presentation. I, uh, this is just my LinkedIn. Anybody wants to add me, uh, you can just scan, but that's my email. Um, so any questions? So I've um, hopefully I haven't, haven't spent a huge amount of the time, but I've, I've still leave about 20 minutes. So any colleagues want, want to, wants to ask me questions and have a discussion is, is more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine, for this really informative and excellent talk with many, many practical examples. Uh, we do have some people lined up to ask you questions, but before yeah. I hand the floor to them, can I just um, yeah. 
ask you a little bit about your views a little bit more about this ethical and responsible use that uh, yeah. was a sort of like fil rouge wasn't it throughout your talk I started with it and and um, kept reminding yeah. us of it and concluded with it but um, <clears throat> I'm still curious if you what are your thoughts on a bit more practical level as well so you yeah. know if staff and students use prompts for their work mm -hmm. and if you're not experts yet in a particular yeah. field how yeah. can you actually evaluate the outcomes um and you know these these sort of con issues of concerns that you listed are all valid but but do they feel a bit too abstract than actually implement it mm -hmm. in your day-to-day -day use so what what yeah. are your thoughts around that yeah, thank you for the question. I think it's a really good question. Um, one thing I would say is um, universities now gradually or start thinking of providing AI education or AI curriculum. It's not AI in education. It's what I meant is AI curriculum, AI education, actually teaching staff and students how to use AI tools more ethically. And I think in many circumstances, people don't really intend to do things badly or they, they're not realizing they actually the, the responses are as unethically or even students when they use it not realizing the consequences so the priority really is need to have that proper training following up um, just what's happening on uh, how people using uh, chat gpt and other generative ai tools and secondly if you're not sure don't use that outpost and ask chat gpt to clarify you can ask directly whether the outputs are genuine or they made or it made it up and it will tell you when it made it up it can be honest in that way and also we, we have access to uh, google just normally like what we do traditionally is if you're not sure with the answers check check on the uh, the more broad on the internet and if you're still not sure don't use it that's the key thing so because it is the consequences can can be very serious if you kind of break the gdpr or if actually you use the wrong information to produce anything as a, a basis and so it becomes even more critical that we know how it to is with, with yeah the, so okay great so i will read out um a question from kathy hills uh so she asked the following what sort of comparisons and differences can be made between learning how to ask questions as a fundamental part of education and becoming an effective prompt engineer? Aren't we learning how to consult a technology that has no sense of meaning? Um, yes. So again, for the moment, prompt engineering, I, I know uh, in industry, it becomes very hot, but in university, again, as as, as with any other technology, we, we are always slow responding to these things. Personally, I do think prompt engineering can be added to sort of a basic training into academic skills. I mean, uh, Her Times Higher Education has published something similar with a similar kind of a suggestions. It's not a huge amount of a sort of a component as academic integrity, but something can be added alongside with the training on ethics. And to actually to take up a job like this, a lot of them will be depending on students themselves, depending on uh, the type of job they're looking for and looking at the job specs, what kind of a skills. If if uh, students pay attention, you, you notice the prompt engineering, a lot of these has a prompt engineering title in it with the words in it, they still ask people to have a basic machine learning knowledge. So it looks glamorous, but the expectation is actually more complex. And very often, the very often the organization don't actually know exactly what they're asking for either because it's such a new area. So it's just a trial error for the moment. But if students in future thinking of taking up any roles like this, I think one side the university can certainly ask as education provider to provide fundamental training, but on the other side, they got to upskills in that area themselves as well, because it's not something uh, fundamentally we deliver at university. That would be my view. And yes, I think for machines, it, it's in, in yeah, like the, 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 the failure, the, the failed example that I showed of me using prompts. It is in the end, we have to understand it's just a machine. It's not a, nowhere near perfect. It's just analyzing how you words, the, the different segments of your words, trying to refigure how to restructure them. So 
it, it, you, you just can't rely on it. It's just basically a utility tool, in my opinion. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we have a question slash comment from Mana Koskan. Do you want to come in yourself, Mana? Hello. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for a really informative uh, presentation. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, can hear you, yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, I just wanted to know that uh, whenever we are using um, ChatGPT 3.5, uh, uh, it, it mentioned that um, the information is regarding to the, uh, the, the updated uh, version is 2021. Uh, yeah. So we can not, we can, we can, we cannot use uh, the recent information. Uh, what shall we do? Because uh, just now you mentioned that it's better than to use of this one and no need to register the new version and something like that. That's why I was wondering that if we want, mm -hmm. for example, using of the uh, chat, um, chat GPT for, for example, uh, something like a literature review or recent uh, news of the uh, the gaps of the studies that we want to uh, apply and uh, something like that. Uh, what should we do? What's your suggestion uh, about this? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think that's a common thing. I, I actually think GPT 3.5 stops um, the, the the information or the, the database stopped, I think about 2019, around 2019. That's where it, when it was developed. So if you want to get latest information, uh, so you can use, I, I do find BAD often is uh, quite useful because BAD, it is powered by uh, GPT 4.0. Uh, also, being being is more like slightly like more advanced level of Google in a way. So it's still more search engine uh, per se. Yeah. Excuse me, sorry, I didn't quite get the last bit. Uh, sorry, I can I cannot hear your voice properly. Could you please uh, yeah. just write the the word, just uh, if it is possible. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put the, in the, the so. That you yeah. Thank you um, so much. So, for for the rest of you, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, so you can do Chat GPT, obviously four point zero, but um and Bing, and also the the latest um Claudi, um I haven't tried it myself, but. The, the feedback I received, it is a quite powerful one and it's free as well. I personally uh, use the BAD a lot. So I use a combination of a BAD and chat GPT if you're looking at latest information from the internet. Uh -huh. How about the Bing? Uh, Bing, as I said, is slightly like more advanced than Google. It doesn't actually do the conversations as well as Bart. So I, I actually prefer Bart than Bing, if that makes sense. You, by all means, try Bing as well. Bing, it is also uh, developed on GPT 4.0 uh, as well. But obviously, you got the option mm -hmm. if you if you got the uh, the funding and you want to pay and you got GPT 4.0. As well. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. That's all right. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. Um, I'm not sure, Sarah Ganim, if you if you want to ask your question yourself or whether I should read it out loud. Um, Sarah, do you want to come in? Okay. So I will read it. Um, if we want to measure how smart um, education is becoming, um, we can have AI as one of the criteria, but what are the elements or examples of AI that can be considered in relation to smart education? What do you mean by smart education? So it's just trying to understand a little bit better when, when, when you refer to, you know, do you- <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Hi, yes, Hello. Sarah. yeah. Good Hi, evening. Yeah. How are you? Thank you very much for such an informative session. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you like uh, it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just asking about um using AI in, in higher education considers yeah. is considered as I mean overall using advanced technologies in education, making education smart, right? So yeah. 
Mm. If we are using AI or implementing AI, mm. I mean, different practices for, for whatever, either for the teachers or by students, we can use AI as one of, cri- of the criteria to measure whether education yeah. is really becoming smart or not, right? Um, you can, yes. If, if you're looking at how do we uh, ad- adopt uh, um, uh, this kind of a technology into education, yes, we, in the way we do make the education a bit more smart, but where it's more critical really is we're looking at the outcomes, whether we achieve the intended effective um, outcomes where we aimed at at the beginning, if that makes sense. So there is a um, there is a training model that uh, very popular in the industry. It doesn't really use so commonly in higher education. It's called Kirkpatrick for levels of evaluation model. So it looking at student feedback and looking at what student well what learner have learned and looking at their behavior and also looking at the final impact uh, to the organization. So similar way for when we actually using technology into our education in particular relating to generative AI, because this is a very practical uh, practical technology. For most of us, when we teach students to use AI for say support their um, study or for tutors to support uh, delivering teaching, however, we actually don't monitor what students do afterwards. Do students actually use them in their learning or in, in their day-to-day activities or what how, how well they actually improved after we providing or we provided that kind of a training to them. So I think when you say smart education, we, we need to see exactly what, what we're trying to achieve from at the beginning and what students and what to, to intend to, you know, to cover in those uh, areas and, and looking at student feedback and, and keep monitoring their kind of a practical implication of that skill related to mainly to chat GPT and generative AI, if that makes sense. Uh, other technologies are slightly different. Yeah, that, that's what was a great answer. Thank you very much. That's all right. Thank you so much. Um, so next one is line is Risti Noviani. If you're here and you want to ask your question. No, okay, shall I read it then? <laughs> what is Chad GPT's role in supporting online education and learning? And what is its potential use in the future? Yeah, I think that's a good question as well. Um, online learning, unfortunately, I mean, after the the the, the pandemic, we, we are, at least in the UK now, we're back to uh, more of a face-to-face learning, but there are still online learning taking place. Um, so in... In general, I think the techniques or the recommendations or the examples I share in the presentation, most of them can be applied into the online environment. But with online learners, a lot more learn lonely and independent. So it's about, if you think about activities, I would say more about focusing on that kind of um, harmony, trying to create that kind of a closeness as a community. So you can ask uh, prom- uh, questions or prompts relating to creating this kind of um, social atmosphere for learners. How can they actually learn in that environment when they don't see each other face to face? And also when you use, um, when they do online assessments in particular, there are loads of things with ChatGPT uh, student use it for cheating. You got to think about the techniques. For example, there's some universities, again, it's about not sharing the question uh, give student printed out questions and to, to just get them to answer question one, two, three, because they can simply copy and paste questions into chat GPT and generate the answers. So it's just that you, you got to think about your prompts within that particular context. Again, depending on the size of your cohort and the subject speciality, do you require hands-on in any other approaches like this? Thank you. And I think this will be the final question, but there was a discussion during your presentation in the chat area around institutional policies. Um, somebody was asking if, uh, for examples of universities, if they, if anyone has actually well-defined AI policy. So perhaps my question would then be, what what is your view? What kind of policies should universities have 
in relation to generative AI and how can they also sort of manage, I suppose, the mm. enactment of all of this in their constituent sort of uh, activities? Yes, so that is a very good question. Again, I think, again, in the UK, uh, the development is quite imbalanced. Some universities uh, do have a good AI policy in position, directing staff and students. But majority universities are not yet are lagging behind. So one example would be, um, so most of us know that uh, um, we turn it in, they had issued an AI detector. Uh, I think the uh, the end of the last term, I said, what term is it? I kind of lost, I think it's more of a summer term. But majority, I know in the UK, majority of the universities, including some I've spoke to colleagues in Australia as well, they actually decided to turn it off as well, did not use it because they worried about the, the complicity caused by using the AI detector. And obviously it's a slightly different story because AI detectors are not accurate yet, but it just shows there's a lot of a, different kind of a development stages. In my opinion, it is really quite important to have that policy in position as soon as possible. And we can't really half-hearted to say to students, well, you can use, but you know, I pretend I don't know you're using it, but then if any questions, I'll deal with it with the uh, kind of under, you know, um, at the hoc kind of a manner. But I think it is important to have that policy in position. In fact, I think that need to be a national one or looking at more of like QA level or advanced HE needs to have that benchmark statement um, directing university what to do and for students and staff, can they use it for their normal daily uh, learning activities, teaching activities, what about assessments, what sort of outputs we can accept when students use a chat GPT generated content. So things like that, it, but we're, we're not there yet. I think it's going to be taking us at least a couple of years to get the policy ready. I suppose also because the practice sort of needs to consolidate as well um, and, yeah. the, and also the all the skills and competences you talked about. It is, yes. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Christine, for, for this talk. Um, just so you know, a lot of people wrote in the chat area how much they enjoyed your presentation. Oh, that's so great. They, yeah. Somebody even said that this was the best webinar they've oh, been thank to. You. <laughs> so, oh, that's very kind of all of you. Um, thank you. So for everyone who's interested, the recording will be published in our usual channels. So on the CG website, as well as on our YouTube channel, where all the webinars and videos are um, published. Um, and just before I let you go to say that the next center webinar is going to be in a week from now, uh, where Sin Ta Tsai will talk about differential peer effects of international roommates on college outcomes, evidence from students of disadvantaged backgrounds. So this concludes this webinar today concludes our series on artificial intelligence in higher education. I think it was an excellent series and a very good way to finish it off uh, with, with such a bang um, from Christine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenna. And thank you for all the questions. And it's really, really nice meeting you all. As I said, if anybody wants to engage in more discussions, want to you know share ideas, we, we always learn from each other. I've learned a lot from today's questions as well. So you feel free to drop me a line, find me on LinkedIn, whichever way works for you. Bye. Bye. Bye.